thank you, Chair. The meeting is now live. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Health and Wellbeing Board meeting on the 6th of September. Um, we'll just start by um, asking if there are any apologies for the meeting. Uh, yes, so I've received apologies from Sonia Johnson, Melanie O'Rourke and David Radbourne. Are there any other apologies or anyone else as a substitute? Looks okay. like not. All right. Um, and then I'll say any declarations of interest. Should I read out the whole thing on this? I would just take it as read. Okay. Um, are there any declarations of interest from anyone? No. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and then, um, are there any urgent items of business? Uh, no, Chair, not notified. Okay, okay. And then on to agenda point four. Um, please, may we approve the minutes from, hello, approve, approve the minutes from the previous meeting, which you will find in your agenda pack. Um, so who can who can approve those? It, I mean, I had to look at them; and they looked okay. But is it my is it within my role to approve them? We just need a proposer yeah. and a seconder. So you can propose anyone to second. Okay, I'll propose. Yeah, happy to happy to second. Thank you. All right, and any matters arising from that from those minutes? Any matters arising that are not in the agenda? No? Okay, thank you. All right then. Um, so then we move over to um, public participation. Um, do we have any questions for the board? Um, yes, Chair, I've received three questions. Um, I believe Gronia's here now, yep. Um, so I'll just share my screen and uh, run through the questions as we receive them. I think uh, Gronia and Nicola, if she's here, is going to provide uh, answers between them, if that's okay. Okay, so the first question, can you see my screen? Great, so the first question is from Sharon Ashmore Hobbs, and it says, please can the board comment on the proposed closure of the SEND Health and Wellbeing Board, Health and Wellbeing Workstream, given that the vast majority of EHCPs are being completed without directly assessing a child's occupational therapy needs. This is further compounded by the lack of inclusion of private assessment information where available. Children undergoing EHCP assessment where OT advice is sought should be seen within a statutory six week period. Surely the board would agree that the triage call where an OT does not even meet the child so they cannot articulate their needs or recommend provision is inconsistent with neither the wording nor the spirit of the SEND code of practice. I think that's Gronio or Nicola. Can you see me okay colleagues, yes? Yeah, yeah. So if I start, I'm not sure I can't see Nicola. Can everybody hear me okay? I'm here, yeah. Grania. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, lovely, Nicola. So Grania Siggins, um, Executive Director of People Services um, for Bracknell Forest Council. So in terms of the of the question, it, it's a it's a really, really good question and one that many of our families are asking in terms of um, access to occupational therapy um, advice and support. But I'll start by answering the first part of it in terms of the waiting times and availability of occupational therapy assessments. Maybe initially Nicola can come in the response for that one. So, so as people, as you may or may not know, um, possibly not because this hasn't come up at the Health and Wellbeing Board previously. We do have a, ro a robust programme um, designed around the delivery of what is our improvement plan, which is called our written statement of action. Our written statement of action includes 113 key actions and sub-actions in order to um, deal with the significant areas of weakness that were identified within um, the joint inspection of SEND services in Bracknell. So the, there was specific activity relating to health related items which were managed and delivered within a work stream um, called health and well-being work stream. So it is accurate this work stream is being wound down in terms of the, the, the closure because the actions have been completed um, in the main. So that was in relation to that direct question from um, Sharon Ashmore Mobs about the process. 
Um, Nicola, do you want to come in on the response we've received from our um, health colleagues who are closer to the advice? Yeah, uh, Granny, I've actually asked um, Ali Woodhouse to come and present because she'll have a better understanding of the detail for me. So Ali, if you could just introduce yourself and then um, provide our response, that would be helpful. Uh, no problem at all. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ali Woodhouse. I'm Head of Transformation for Frimley ICB with a responsibility for SEND and Children's Mental Health and have been um, very closely um, associated with this particular work stream um, that this question is, is around. So, yes, just to follow on from what Bronya has confirmed about the closure of this particular work stream, um, just to reaffirm that um, obviously we will be continuing through our other, other governance structures and processes to uh, monitor the effectiveness of the current therapy service and also um, continue with our service development um, that is, is, is part of our business as usual now. So in terms of the second um, element of the, the question, um, and there is a detailed written response that we will be sharing after this board with um, uh, the, the, the people who actually po pose the question because they're not here today. There is a triage process that the service uses, which is a very cl common clinical tool um, for most health services. Um, and as part of that quite detailed triage process, there's a report that is um, produced um, with the next steps outlined. And some of these next steps um, may uh, be signposting, may be some support and advice for other professionals involved in that young person, um, all the way up to and including a full assessment. So whilst um, we don't have a full assessment for all of the children and young people referred to the service, this is um, based on the clinical need, which is assessed as part of that triage process, which is, a, as I said, a common clinical tool that's used through services. And just to address the... Um, the, set, the last part of that question, which is about the, the SEND code of practice, the SEND code of practice very specifically outlines advice, not assessment as the response by health professionals around therapy services. And so therefore, you know, the advice is given and it is graduated in the response. So that's um, just a brief outline of the process, but I've got a lot more detail if any members are interested in understanding a little bit more about the clinical process around the triage. Is that all right, Nicola? That's good for me, Ali. I don't know, uh, Chair, if there's any further questions. Um, so on the on that question, there's a supplementary question, which I'll just move on to. If everyone's ready. Yeah. Okay, so what evidence of impact has the Health and Wellbeing Workstream project team gathered to gain confidence that the work of this group has met its targets and to ensure that there was there is real life change for families? Has there been endorsement of this impact by community co-production partners such as Bracknell Parent Carer Forum? Do you want me to answer or Gronja, do you want to come in first mm. and then I can supplement? I'll come in initially. So yeah. in terms of the health and wellbeing work stream, and um, people be aware that we've just had a latest quarterly update with NHS England and Department for Education, which does require us to prepare a very detailed um, response and update, including evidence of impact on our delivery of key, um, key actions within the written statement of action. So I can confirm that in relation to the aspects that were considered within that quarterly report, um, that they have actually been met and signed off through that formal process. As part of the work that we undertake as part of the health and wellbeing work stream, that activity has also been reported to the SEND Improvement Partnership Board. Um, who've actually seen the very detailed activity relating to those actions and sub-actions and agreed with the position and the, the positive response in terms of the impact. As we know, that does in also include parent care of forum members. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Ali, did you want to supplement, Ali? I can. Um, and so just to confirm with everybody um, on this call, and again, it's outlined in the written response that we will be submitting back. We do have a Bracknell Parent Care representative on the work stream who's fully endorsed all of the activities um, that we have been conducting. Um, just for everyone's information, one of the key um, evidences of impact has been the reduction in waiting time. So we have reduced from just under 70 weeks waiting um, to under 30 weeks waiting in a 12 month period. And we will continue to focus on uh, reducing those waiting times further with the continued work that we are doing um, um, 
as our business as usual once this um, work stream has closed. And we have a, a series of um, oversight and governance structures to continue and mo to monitor that work. And there are actually a lot of other impacts that we have outlined in the in the written response as well, including feedback from parent carer users um, and some other uh, feedbacks from professionals, obviously, in, in the field as well. Brilliant. Thank you very much for those responses. Thank you. Are there any additional questions? Lizzie, you're on mute. Thank you. Yes, uh, there were, I just had uh, technical issues. So the second question, can you see my screen now? Yep, it's from Licky, Vicky Lejeune. Uh, will all children be giving OT assessments within the EHCP timescale? And if they cannot meet the deadline, will they be done privately instead rather than them being triaged or not done at all? Ali, could you want to respond to this one, please? Hello. Sorry, I just uh, uh, forgot to unmute. So um, as referenced in the previous question, OT is, a full OT assessment isn't necessarily what happens with all of those uh, referrals. So advice uh, may be given in different forms, and I've outlined some of those in, in the, the previous question. Um, in terms of the deadline and Gronia, obviously each local authority um, has a position on the use of private assessments. I understand from colleagues within the SEND, private assessments are considered when um, an, an NHS commission service hasn't been able to provide an assessment for whatever reason. I think that's in the, contained in the written response. Thank you. If there's nothing further to add, we'll move on to the next question which is question C from Emma Hester. Does the board have an awareness that EHCPs are being finalized even if advice that is needed agreed by all parties is incomplete and that completion of EHCPs is being used as a measure of progress in the same strategy? Shall I come in, um, Chair? So in terms of this one, people may or may not be aware, but the oversight for the improvements on um, in delivery of the SEND written statement of action is via the SEND Improvement Partnership Board. The SEND Improvement Partnership Board reviews a very comprehensive data matrices, uh, which includes all aspects of education, health and care plans. That information is operational data and not data that is in the public domain. So I can confirm today that the SEND Improvement Partnership Board, which includes, is co-chaired between myself and um, Tracy Faraday Drake, who is the Executive Director for Children and Young People for NHS from the ICB Integrated Care Board. Um, that information is received and discussed um, at the bi monthly meetings of the SEND Improvement Partnership Board. Thank you very much. And there's a supplementary to this one, which is, is the Director of Children's Services able to comment on whether data is being scrutinised to identify what percentage of EHCPs are finalised with, uh, with outstanding advice and how this impacts on the accuracy of overall reporting of EHCP completion? So, yeah, yes, thank you. Um, the information that we receive and review, um, both operationally and overseen by the SEND Improvement Partnership Board, includes all aspects of education, health and care plans, including ones that are in train and not yet concluded. So we monitor both, um, we also monitor the plans that when we know we're managing inside of the statutory timeline of 20 weeks. And we also monitor the ones outside of the timeline within 20 weeks. So we have a significant volume of both operational and performance um, data that we use both internally and then with the oversight of the SEND Improvement Partnership Board to monitor the completion rates in terms of education, health and care plans. Thank you, Chair. If that um, concludes all the answers, then I think we are finished public questions. Thank you. Thank you. So then, um, Staying with SEND and moving on to agenda, um, is that right? Am I, shall I move on to the agenda point seven um, for a SEND programme update, please? 
Um, I think that's Kelly Williams. Is Kelly here in the meeting? Sorry, I, I'm she's, just got a delay. She's not, sorry. She's not. Okay. Um, one moment. So can somebody put the... Um, sorry, I'm just trying to obtain a report. On page 13 of the agenda. Yeah. Okay, so I will deliver. Um, Ali, if you want to come in as required or yourself, um, Nicola, then that will be fine. I'm assuming people have got a copy of the information um, in front of them. So um, the, the slide deck you have in front of you is a very detailed operational slide deck in terms of what we utilize internally um, to manage the program, the health of the program and the various different work streams that we have in place. And um, so the way it's actually structured is to give us um, an indication of the key pieces of work um, and also both in terms of current progress and progress giving us a forward look of activity. So the, the questions have obviously come from the information that was um, um, was provided um, in the public forum um, so that they've been quite helpful in actually pulling some of that out. In terms of the work streams, in order to respond to and deliver the 113 um, actions within the written statement of action, the four projects have continued. Um, the health and wellbeing project, I think we've given sufficient um, discussion on those actions. So in the interest of time, I will move on to data monitoring and oversight. In terms of data monitoring and oversight, um, we've got a very um, a significantly progressed um, um, combined dashboard to actually oversee um, the monitoring um, of, of SEND. Obviously, we're also looking at, um, continually looking at the quality monitoring of education, health and care plans. Um, but there has been um, some um, delay in terms of um, moving forward some of those actions formally, and they are included in there. Um, I have personally seen one of the latest um, um, comprehensive audits on education, health and care planning. It's a very, very thorough audit on behalf of uh, the partnerships with key learning points to ensure that we're continuing to progress in terms of the quality of the education, health and care plans, which we, we do know um, is an ongoing process in terms of the work we're undertaking. Um, in terms of the, the data set, because it's been a line of inquiry, I'll continue on that route. It is really important that we're actually, the information we are monitoring and reporting is the right information. And, and one of the recent, um, in my view, successes that we've been able to achieve is to um, include data that doesn't necessarily directly relate to um, all aspects of education and health and care plans, but does have an impact. And I, I can confirm that we, um, with Tracy Faraday Drake now co-chairing the Send Improvement Partnership Board, um, Tracy has also agreed to um, us looking into the inclusion of um, child and adolescent mental health service waiting times into that data matrix um, as part of that work moving forward, which I'm sure people um, will be pleased to, to hear. Um, processes and systems, moving on to that work stream, the processes and system work stream is the one that we have been reporting um, as delayed in part. And people will know that we did put some significant investment into the SEND service and infrastructure last November. However, it has taken us some time to actually provide, um, secure the right people um, into the post so there has a delay there has been a delay in recruitment and retention to those key posts which is um now in the majority of their posts are now recruited to and um, so the work has been taking place including over the summer to undertake that detailed mapping work about the improvement in um somebody's journey through our system so parents um, child young person's journey through our system with their education health and care plans and understanding what that looks and feels like for them and where we can make improvements and making sure that that information is fully documented and understood and followed by all the workers. So that work has been progressed to understand what we're doing now and what improvements need to be made in order for us to do things differently in the future. So that work has been progressing well, but to just to confirm that work was delayed from the original written statement of action timelines, which were agreed in June, July last year. 
Now, it almost eat well a year in. It's understandable that some of that, there will be some delays and, and, and changes. And those, um, those delays have been agreed with Department for Education and NHS England. Um, the capita system, just to explain what the capita system is, the capita system is referenced in that slide and the capita system is a system that we have for recording information relating to education, health and care plans so that we have a record um, ideally that's kept up to date when where the information is accurate. There has been some significant developments in terms of both what the information is contained in there but also what amendments or changes called reconfiguration we can make to that system so that it gives us better information out in the future and that work again is progressing and um, there has been some delay um, in the development in capita for a range of reasons so but that work will continue as identified there including um, with the support from our internal IT team and the organisation who provide capita. Um, in terms of the, the programme risks and delivery we, we do monitor these on a on a regular basis and you'll see um, that the issue about the leadership capacity and capacity within the teams has been a concern for us for some time. Um, we are mindful of the volume of work required both on the improvement journey and to improve the experience for um, parents and um, carers and children young people um, and our education leaders. So we were exceptionally mindful of that and keep it monitored on an ongoing basis. And obviously the other area that we mentioned on, it was useful in Sharon Ashmore Mob's question as well about impact. Uh, we are continuing to um, secure and record and being able to evidence um, the impact of the work that we've been doing. And that is an ongoing process um, moving forward. Um, I'll take questions there, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, any questions for um, Grunia? Can I just ask one question, Grunia? Of um, when you when you answered the question earlier, you talked about um, uh, there being a panel and there's parents with um, Bracknell Forest parents who have children with um, send needs. Um, what was the name of that panel? I missed it. So we've got various opportunities for our parent carers um, to be involved in the work that we're doing. So mm. we, we have commissioned the Parent Carer Forum um, mm -hmm. to undertake um, significant um, involvement and co-production activity and all of the work of the um, written statement of action. So those work streams that I've just described, all mm -hmm. of those projects have parent carer representatives on there and give their mm -hmm. views firsthand of what it feels like. So they're helping design and shaping those services. So we have it within all of those projects, but we also have their full involvement and parent care reform, so parent representatives full involvement in the SEND Improvement Partnership Board, which is a formal governance board on the detail and oversight of our progress in delivering the written statement of action actions. Okay, and how many parents are there roughly? Who, who come to uh, these I'll have to, uh, throughout, I will have to give you that detail separately because I don't have that to hand. Okay. Um, but, but what we, what, like, what we yeah, sorry, yeah. what we have commissioned parent care reform to do, part mm. of the work we've asked them to do is to make sure that their reach is far and wide into Bracknell. So as right. a parent care yeah. forum, they are an independent body and their ability to reach as many parents as possible is really important. So over the past um, 12 months, they have increased the number of parents that they engage with um, mm -hmm. so that they can then all input and share their views. And that can be fed through the representative body, which is a parent care forum. Um, but in terms of the individuals involved in the specific group activity, I'll provide that information separately. OK, thank you. Excellent. Any further questions? Okay. Um, so therefore we'll move on to agenda point eight, which is the health and wellbeing strategy progress update. Um, so this is Hema, is that right? Thank you, Chair. So there are three elements to the progress report. One is what's in the cover report, which is across what we've been doing in the last um, quarter, which covers this report. For each priority, there are elements which has progressed uh, and the next steps. 
the appendix two is the second element, which gives you an overview of all the 51 actions. So as you will know from the report, we have 36 outcomes that we as a board agreed to improve and to deliver those outcomes improvement, we have 51 actions or key actions or interventions that we are delivering across the three or four year period. So that appendix gives you an indication of not all of them are starting at the same time. So some of them will be starting next year, but it gives you an indication of which have started, whether they're on track, whether they're delayed or they are severely delayed, which are red, or um, amber, green. And then the third element are two projects that are being presented today. Uh, one is from, uh, both are related to priority two. One is Saunders from the MHST team in Bracken Forest in terms of the work that is being done in schools for children and young people's mental health. And the other one is Catherine McDonald, the work they are doing on emotional, with adults, low level emotional health, which gives us an indication of the need across Bracken Forest you know, can be done. So I think those two projects will take some time in terms of presentation. So in terms of the main report in terms of 51 actions, are there any questions particularly people want to ask before we move on to the projects? And I can go through everything, but it just is going to take a lot of time. Sorry, you may you just I'm just looking at the agenda pack. Are you, are you talking about the this um, page that's called um, Joint Health and Wellbeing Strategy Delivered Progress Report? That one. Yeah. So that's yeah. the first okay. part. Pete is a cover report which we have said. I've got. We also have recommendations. Yeah. So the first recommendation, which I thought after the presentation, perhaps the board can agree on the recommendations. So mm -hmm. um, the first one is to approve the progress to date and provide feedback on mm -hmm. the improvement trajectory. What are the next steps? The second one is that we have the, you have the reports which were circulated to everybody, which was on the self-harm uh, project, which was also presented last time, but now we have the final report. But what we are recommending is that this, should, this is on the Children and Young People's Partnership Board, and that's perhaps the best place where it can be delegated to make those discussions on the recommendations because you've got official as well as the staff there and it requires everybody to have a view on that. So rather than health and health being board, we are asking this to give it to the Children and Young People's Partnership Board. And the third one, which is quite important is that uh, all the different organizations, the board members representing the organizations have got um, interventions that their organizations are delivering or are the main lead for that uh, delivery. It would be useful if these are monitored through the internal senior management meetings so that um, if there are any things which are delayed, A, the organization has a view on you know, how the delivery is happening. And if anything has been delayed, it can be flagged up to the senior management team, which makes it easier for us then to uh, record those on, us, on our dashboard as well. So these are the three recommendations that have come to the board to be approved. And, uh, they can be approved now or perhaps after the presentations. Thank you, Hima. I can see um, Andrew's got his hand up. Sorry, Andrew, if you put it up earlier, it's not used to Zoom. But yeah, there we are. Go for it. Um, thanks, Chair. Um, thanks, Hima. Really helpful report. It's really good to see in the the body of the main report, the sort of the outcomes mm -hmm. and how we're measuring against those. I think against the 51 actions, they're all kind of quite processy and it would be quite good. I know we've talked about having a dashboard that we can bring to the, the board yeah, that yeah. At the next time we we pick up not only kind of how it whether it's on track, what outcome it's having, mm. and perhaps who who's the lead. Um, organization or individual who's taking that forward so that if there are any we want to do a deep dive in or if we want anyone to go back to their organization to help um, move things forward on something I think that would be helpful but this is a good step forward from the last report and it, it starts to help us see that we are actually making quite a lot of progress and it's good to see green against many of the actions so um, thank you for the work on that. No, I think I agree, uh, Andrew, and we are working on that. We've had meetings, I've had meetings with uh, um, various people in Nicholas, I mean, in um, Gronia's team also to look at how we deliver this dashboard. So it's in progress. So next time when we bring, we'll be able to just bring the dashboard, which not only gives the key actions, but in terms of the outcomes. And we have also started to collect baselines for everything because not every, where we have got 
obviously there are trajectories which we can input, but I agree with you, you know, next board will have the full. Thank you. Are there any more questions before Hima moves on to the next part? Oh, sorry, Susan. Sorry. That's okay, thanks, Chair. Just, uh, just uh, to, to echo um, Andrew Hunter's um, points around um, how this is, has progressed, um, and it's it's really, really very helpful. And I, just to further the point around um, supporting our respective organisations and how we as, as a board can unblock things. So if through this reporting, if we can be clear where there are blockages, um, for whatever reason, barriers, the wicked issues, um, then there's there's always the ask of the possible uh, and um, working collaboratively through this board to look at how we can undo um, uh, and overcome so some of those barriers. So if we can start to tease that out um, through this process, I think that'd be really, really helpful. Um, and, and I think it shows the value of the board coming together. Thank you. Back to you, Hima. Okay. Um, perhaps, Peter, do you want to start off with your presentation? So this is related to priority two, and this is the work that the mental health support teams are doing in Bracknell and gives an idea about the progress uh, that's being done. And what I also want to say is we are working very closely with them to look at the whole school approach to health and well-being. So some of the questions that come may perhaps be um, sitting with the whole school approach to not only mental health, but whole school approach to health and well-being. Peter, do you want to I'll hand over to you? Do you want to give an introduction to yourself and to the presentation? Yes, uh, thanks, Eva. Um, firstly, thanks, thank, thank you everyone for the opportunity to be able to come and share with you. Um, uh, the work that I do is one of my personal passions, so if I had any opportunity to kind of share it with anybody, I, I'd love to be given the opportunity, so thank you for, for that. Um, so I'm the Senior Psychological Therapist and Clinical Supervisor for the Mental Health Support Team, um, and I've got a presentation here for you today to, uh, just to give you an idea about sort of the, uh, for those of you that are aware of the Thrive Framework, I'll give a bit of an explanation as we go through. It's kind of uh, a combination of both the getting advice and getting help level work and that to get, uh, that goes into the um, into the community. So, um, I, I think I've got about sort of ten or fifteen minutes. Hema, is that right for for, for present time, or do, do you need me to shorten it because or expand it? Because I can talk at length if I need to. Chair, what would you yeah. suggest? Right. Yeah, I think ten minutes would be fine. And please do share right. your slides. Yeah. Yeah. We'll do. Okay. So okay, I'm hoping that should. Okay. Great, okay, so uh, so yeah, I'm here representing the CAS Mental Health Support Team. And I, I guess it's where to start with is, so for those that aren't aware that this comes out of the Mental Health Support Teams as part of a national rollout initiative um, coming out of the Transforming Children and Young People's Mental Health Provision a Green Paper. Um, one of the very rare papers that are actually co-founded um, co by the Department of Health and Department of Education, really to address the sort of the boundaries of a lot of silo working between various departments, right from the top right to the bottom sort of thing. Essentially, for me, the simple the headline there is about trying to bring CAMS a bit more, working a little bit more closely with um, with schools and the wider community and the local authority, really, which, I, which makes a lot of sense. Um, it's kind of based along the Thrive framework. So this is about reshaping and thinking about uh, give it a framework to conceptualize what the kind of the needs of the various populations are of children and young people for those of you that might be aware of adult mental health models um, they use a, a step one step two step three step um, stepping up approach um, this is kind of like the children's version of it as well so um, but with different uh, children and young people and their families tend to sit in one of those four kind of levels starting from getting advice right it's just, then beginning with intervention at getting help, getting more intensive help at getting more help level, and then prioritizing risk and safety at the start of the getting risk support. In terms of where the MHST sits, um, we, we do provide early intervention therapeutic 
uh, the therapeutic inputs at Getting Help, but we also do a lot of the getting advice and giving people the right information to make changes to their lives, both um, as for schools, um, themselves and how they approach and what we what we call whole school approaches to to mental health um but also about promoting well-being and getting the right information there out, out into the community so there's a bit of mental health promotion work as well um we are quite a small team so um i fit under the senior clinical supervisor in that role some of you might have met my uh, my manager um yanni chocolinkum the team lead we also have Faye and things, but um, we've got two trainee EMHPs. Um, we've got one qualified in the in the team at the moment, um, and, so, uh, and we, with a new one on the way to join us in October. Um, and the team admin, team admin to keep us in check, really. Um, so uh, I guess before I just dive into that, the MHST we support uh, 17 schools. It's four large secondary schools um, in the Bracknell community, that being Garth Hill, Brackenhale, Kings, East Hampstead Park, and Kings Binfield. Um, and then uh, the rest is, all, is made up of lots of single form and two form entry primary schools in the area, um, as well as college hall, pupil referral units, and um, Kennel Lane Specialist School as well. Um, so how we set, split, split everybody up is that the EMHPs kind of uh, share the schools between them um, and then the two senior clinic, uh, the clinical supervisor and the senior clinical supervisor kind of uh, split the schools to, to oversee the EMHPs work with them as well. Um, so I've been asked here to talk to you about kind of what we've been doing um, for whole school approach work and we've been going for the last two years um with all of all 17 schools and there's it's been a real trailblazing learning experience for everybody our schools and ourselves um lots of staff turnover but to be honest i'm the longest serving member of the team uh, so, uh and i've only been in the team sort of uh, two and a half years so um but one of the things that we uh, tried to establish in this last academic year is actually trying to implement one of our principles um, around measuring impact, which is what is bringing sort of the psychological approach uh, to understanding uh, our mental health promotion and, and things within schools. So a key part of our work is actually going into a school um, and providing a consultation space for staff about the pupils that they want, that they are curious about whether or not there might be a mental health concern or emotional well-being concern um and and sometimes in that uh, um sometimes other issues so one of the things we started and uh, objectives that we set for ourselves last year was to actually measure and see what we're being brought to to understand the need because actually what what our school's bringing to us so i'm not going to go too much into these slides because i've um to be honest it's a lot of data um so i'm going to give you guys the the headlines here, but um, I've included the slides here for reference for everybody if you want to go and look back. But as you can see, um, the last academic year, started, so autumn term, spring term, summer term, we tend to start slowly because actually everybody settles themselves into the summer term. Some of you might have children start at school right now, for example, and if you're working with schools, they tend to be on the wind up at this moment, uh, getting back into getting get the saddle as it were. We learned, learned that a, a lot of our referrals then start shooting up. Um, so we start seeing sort of the just before Christmas and then the early New Year that our referrals sort of goes up. But for those of you that are eagle-eyed on that on the stat, really here is is that um, uh, you, we're looking at only uh, that only more more than 50 percent so 46 are accepted that tells us that actually there's a lot of need being brought to the mental health support teams from schools that we're saying is probably not for early intervention for mental health yeah um so what does that mean um so what, what does that look like in terms of our schools well our primary schools that um for um the, what red yellow schools means for everybody here is just this is one grouping of we have a mhp attack in, in the group of yellow schools and the yellow schools primary schools we saw that they um, were bringing they were bringing a lot of cases um, so Wooden Hill, um, Oakwood, 
uh, Kings, Oakwood and Binfield, there was there were quite a few being declined. Um, and to give an example of this, um, the sorts of things that were coming to the consultations and uh, as you can see from the pie charts here, is that there were quite a lot of difficulties relating to um, autism. There was quite a diff lot of difficulties related to other um, neurodiverse, neurodevelopmental needs. Um, and there were some other sort of social care issues kind of being brought up and things. So it, it, it taught us quite a lot about um, that actually the understanding of mental health and early intervention and the different the, the different thresholds of services and how to use cams and how to use mental health services there's work to be done there yeah um so to give you an idea um of where we're sending people is that if it wasn't for us we were either sending people to youth line but there was a lot of referrals be uh, lots of signposting being sent over to gems for health and parenting special children which are the commission services for neurodiversity um we noticed a lot of schools were bringing and using the word anxiety and using the word depression um but when we were triaging and discovering a little bit more about the case and getting a bit more of the context and uh, through our triaging consultation work it looked like actually that there were either family environments or school environments that weren't properly ad properly adjusted for uh, suspected autism and ADHD um, and need and families needed support to make those adjustments as part of it. Um, to give another highlight as well from our from the blue cl cluster here we also noticed that then there was um, some uh, rises in in behavioural difficulties as well. Um, and when we're talking about behavioural difficulties here at like Harmon's Water, um, just for reference, um, we have a space in Harmon's Water Primary School as a drop down office space for the MHST. Um, and I think we've uh, probably done, probably not been as helpful as we could have been uh, by being on site with them because I think they I think they were hoping that we would probably do a lot a lot more than we could by being on site. Um, so the cases that they were bringing uh, around behavioural difficulties, we do offer an intervention for incredible years, but um, when we were exploring sort of behavioural difficulties, it looked like there was quite, um, Harmon's Water were bringing quite a lot of um, social, uh, lots of families with social care needs that were leading to behavioural different difficulties. So uh, again, the thinking, highlighting to us about the difference between the clinical view of mental health and the community's view of mental health and try and, and thinking that we need to be bridging that. Yeah. Um, so it's not too different in the red schools, primary schools there, so I'm not going to sit with those too much, but when it comes to the other schools, you can then see that um, we were allocated the Kennel Lane Specialist School and the Pupil Referral Unit um, in College Hill. For those of you who are aware of College Hill, there's been um, a variety of needs, um, staffing turnover and issues kind of going on at College Hall. Um, their population is often more in the getting more help and getting risk support levels of the Thrive Framework. So a lot of our work was about skilling up and supporting the staff being able to target their referrals a little bit more and, and seek out additional support rather than early intervention. However, I'm really pleased to say that actually through kind of extensive work and working with um, Becky Freeman, particularly at Calvary College Hall, we have actually been able to accept a referral from um, College Hall for early intervention work, which is a real positive that we're able to have a bit more direct intervention there. Now, secondary schools, um, we really learned from our consultation work there that our secondary schools are the biggest driver. And this is because of the population size. The secondaries are huge, um, thousands of pupils at different sites. Um, as you can kind of see here, um, we started initially in a pilot working with Garth Hill and Bra Brackenhale. They've really got the remit. So I'm really pleased to say that they are really understanding the remit of our services and we're starting to accept more referrals from them and they know how to use our consultations and um, I have to give specific praise to Garth and Bracken Hale they've really included their staffing and their heads of years in the consultation process so they invite heads of years and staff into the consultations with our senior mental health lead um, and we're able to share learning and 
and bridge that gap between the community view and the clinical view of mental health um, a lot more there. However, there has been more challenges with engaging um, East Hampstead Park um, and King's Binfield. Um, definitely due to uh, our view is about sort of a different, uh, there's a different culture and a different view of mental health from those sorts of things. And in terms of it being prioritized by the senior leadership teams, the head teachers and things like that, very di sort of different views of what how to use the ment mental health support team. Uh, it, the headline for everybody here is that we'd really like East Hampstead Park in King's Binfield. We know the population size that there should be more people there that they're bringing. And we would like them to look a little bit more like the stats on the right hand side of Garth Hill and Brackenhill. So what are we going to do about that? Because um, as you can see here, there's a variety of needs. Again, that this idea of seeing neurodiversity and anxiety and de de depression there because it's kind of um, cons bringing cases um, for mental health that turned out to be neurodiversity was a big picture in our secondary schools as it was in our primary schools. So um, the, the key learning points here is that um, we, we definitely want to be improving the referral routes, and, but some of our schools are definitely ready to start taking over and start internally triaging. We're, our role is to scale up the senior mental health leads so that they can, so that as, as they're on site on a day-to-day -day basis, staff can st start talking about referrals or the needs of the, the mental health of their pupils on a daily basis, rather than waiting for the very small mental health support team to come around every sort of four, like three, four, five or six weeks. Um, one thing that's been really, uh, that we've noticed as part of that is that um, some of our senior mental health leads have sadly moved on or retired in some situations. And some of you might be aware that there's some, um, there have been some grants and some funding for training for senior mental health leads. Those that have received it have really been able to make use of the mental health support team and increased access to mental health for their pupils. However, once one of our schools has had that grant, they don't have another grant. And then we're, we're kind of, without that training, they're definitely at a disadvantage. Um, but uh, I think point two here around pet care training and making and developing staff and increasing their awareness about mental health. I think increasing the amount of training for school staff and getting schools to reprioritize um, inset training time and things about mental health well-being. I know that like the self-harm forum that we've talked about here before. All of these things are going to be really helpful to, to help them on a day-to-day -day basis be thinking about the needs that their students are bringing forward. So we're going to be increasing pet care training. So to give you the headlines of what we're going to do next uh, for the, the plans for the next academic year, um, first of all is that we're going to further develop the principle of understanding need. Um, so last year um, we were capturing data about our whole school approach activities. However, it, it just to give you all a bit of a thinking point, actually, how do you measure a principle? We all hold principles, but how would you be able to quantify or, me or, or measure your, a principle in yourself and when you're demonstrating a particular principle? Um, and that's how we clumsily recorded data initially in the early stages of it. So we're, we're now going to move towards um, a self-evaluation toolkit that I'll talk about in the next slide. but. To give you an idea, um, the, the way that we recorded information, it really showed that the targeted support with the high numbers there shows that we were going out, doing consultation work, trying to upskill the school community about mental health and triaging on case by case basis. You can also see that we've really given it a good go about staff development and trying to deliver pet care training and staff resilience training and things like that as well. Um, you'll also see at the bottom there working with parents and carers. We do do coffee mornings and uh, try to be present with the white carers, but um, it's really difficult to capture data about the other principles there. It's really hard to make it tangible. So what we're going to do for this next year over the summer holidays, we've been busy uh, crafting a self-evaluation toolkit for our MHST schools, which is simply um, a, a quite a ba basic document where we think about all of the various different principles and the different steps to well-being that are put out by the uh, mentally Healthy Schools um, Institute over at the Anna Freud Centre. 
Um, and so all of our EMHPs are going to be going out in September, this uh, this September, to meeting with their senior mental health leads, establishing a mental health action group, and then setting some goals for whole school approach work. And I think this is going to be a much more, this is going to be a much better way of measuring the impact of whole school approach work by hopefully starting to see that those self-evaluation ratings will start increasing from the more input that we put into school and also I think it helps us be a bit more targeted on what the whole community would like to see as a whole school approach to mental health in their school rather than just our senior mental health lead yeah um, so as part of that we're going to, to try and inspire some good practice um, sorry next slide um, we have now instigated and set up, inspired by our colleagues over in the Reading Mental Health Support Team to start off a senior mental health lead forum. So this is gonna be a, a space that meets three to four times a year um, where all of our senior mental health leads come together um, and share their good practice, share the, the whole school approach project work they're doing on their sites. And with the idea that it's going to inspire some of the others, I think, when we share some of the things that can be helpful for a school, I think it becomes much more impactful and powerful for a school when they see it working at another site. So that's why we want to bring everyone together so to help kind of inspire a little bit more engagement from the, some of those sites that we think could probably engage with the mental health support team a bit more. So the first one I'm pleased to say is going to be at Ricardo Primary School. Um, and we've got almost 80% of our schools already signed up for that. So I'm really excited. Um, the good news about this as well as part of, for the, of to the interest of the um, health and wellbeing board here is that the Reading guys are about two or three years ahead of us and after they established their senior mental health forum in the first year for mental health support uh, support team schools they then expanded it to include any school in their area to be coming along to the forum and I think this could be a really helpful way that we could actually take a lot of the learning that we're taking in our mental health support team schools to inspire every school in um, Bracknell to kind of implement and use strategies to improve whole school approaches in every school. Yeah. Um, so that would be our aim is that we're going to see how it goes this year, reflect, review, and maybe open up the invite come next term, uh, next, next academic year. We're also going to be establishing our mental health action groups. Um, I, um, I know Catherine Davies has already been in touch with uh, about using the Youth Champions Initiative um, as part of this, but one of the things that we've really reflected on is that we've predominantly heard the voices of our senior mental health leads, and some of them are really on the polls, really know their schools, but the voices that we haven't heard are our parents and carers of the school sites, and the voices of the students themselves. We've done bits here or there. So we have engaged with the Oxwell, um, Oxwell study um, and we have got attended coffee mornings and taken views of parents through those sites. But one of the things, one of our focuses that are gonna be for this next year is about establishing mental health action groups. So that's going to be about getting um, representation from students, from parents, and representation and from the senior mental health on the MHST, bring them together to them to evaluate where they think the whole school approaches are and co collectively identify whole school approach goals. And I think that will probably, I think it's going to give us lots more opportunity for learning and um, help us be a little bit more targeted about what everyone would like to see as a whole school approach to mental health in each of our schools. Um, and then finally, um, the as part of the five steps to mental health and well-being, if you're interested, you know, if you search for mentally healthy um, schools website, lots of resources for school staff um, at, every, at every varying level. Um, but one of the things we're going to be thinking about is is the environment and in introducing pep care and training more of our staff to be able to deliver pep care and really try to push the pep care training um, around the various to topics around the community. Um, but I guess the other part of it is that we know that um, promoting the mental health support team, getting us a bit more visually uh, around, around one of the things that we learned from one of our EMHPs doing an audit was that pupils were saying that they didn't really know who we are when we were turning up. The students didn't really know us. I, th I think we need to address that. We need to make ourselves nice and visual um, so that pupils know who the mental health support team is in our schools as well. 
And alongside this as well, I think there's going to be a lot about helping our schools thinking about their environment. Um, I'd like to just give some praise to King's East Hampstead Park. They have some really great rooms available for those of LGBTQI um, populations or and they also have a really uh, kind of welcoming sensory space for the neurodiverse population in their schools. Um, something that isn't always um, at, not, not as obvious at some of our other sites as well. So we'd like to expand, expand environmental changes as well. Um, and I really to say is I think uh, quite a few of our senior mental health leads um, they're really the, the unsung heroes of the mental health support team. These are the guys that are signing up, have a keen interest and quite passionate about mental health themselves and are working in the schools. And so we've really taken, taken this opportunity of having the MHST of two hands and have demonstrated to us that they're probably now ready to start taking a bit more of an active lead rather than us being the clinical experts. I think we can hand the keys over a little bit more to those guys. So we're going to be hand the keys over to the, the senior mental health leads a bit more in this next year. So um, that's everything. It's a whistle stop tour. Um, I talk at a million miles an hour, um, although I'm sure you, you might be uh, used to that in some presentations with this. Um, I'm hoping I kept to time, but um, is there any questions at all? Uh, Grania, you have a question? Yes, um, so Grania Siggins, um, Executive Director of People. Um, thank you, Peter. That's a very informative um, presentation. Really enjoyed listening to the content. Um, from when I go to schools and talk to head teachers, and, and often being in schools when um, clearly some of the students and some of the heads, some of the teachers are. Um, feeling the impact um, in terms of some of the pressures that are exhibited um, by children um, in those schools. It, you've indicated progress to date. If you're going to say to the Health and Wellbeing Board, what else do we need to do to, number one, recognise the additional pressures that is there post-COVID in those school environments for a range of reasons? What would you focus our attention on um, as a Health and Wellbeing Board for if you're pushing us to do more, what would that look like? Um, oh, what, a, what, a, what a really lovely broad question because I think you know there's always an opportunity to do more. I mean, if given the, like just the staffing resources really um, for the mental health support team, I think that the that you will see uh, an increase in the in the benefits. The, the the more that we can, rather than spreading our EMHPs across four sites, if we could have spread our EMHP across three sites or two sites so that they could really get to know the, their school site and the, and, the, and the staff, the parent carers and things rather than having their, times to, their, their, their time divided. I, I think that there's an opportunity to do more there. I think that it would also be, um, I think in having some opportunities to bring together the senior leadership team or the governors of, uh, of our mental health support team sites and our school and school and all of our schools in, in the Bracknell community as well because I think there are often a lot of the feedback that we have been getting from our senior mental health leads is that um, is that it, there's a there's sometimes there's a feeling that the senior leadership teams in, in schools can say that they really prioritize um, mental health and emotional well-being is a is a fo focus for them but then for me, I mean, I'm a cognitive behavioral therapist by profession, and I think what you do is more important than what you say. Um, and when, when kind of giving protected time and allocating sort of resources, even just rooms and spaces for the mental health support team in sites, I think more could be done there to, to, uh, yeah, just from, from simple like uh, work plans and have prioritizing work streams and giving more time to the senior mental health leads to do what they need to do and um, and things like that. So the case in point is that um, I think King's East Hampstead Park, for example, I think it would really benefit from pet care training and things, but there's been a real resistance to offer more than one hour periods where if our schools were kind of asked or instructed almost to, you know, to, to uh, allocate a certain amount of their time to um, 
learn and understand sort of mental health difficulties um, and uh, go and to receive pep care I think that would probably have quite a lot of tangible benefits and yeah having additional funding for um, senior mental health lead training as well would be being part of it um, but I think uh, we can do with we can do quite a lot with what we have um, linking up with the youth champions linking up with our school nurses including our educational psychology to, to service a little bit more in our day-to-day operation and to kind of attend consultations and expanding our multidisciplinary approaches rather than just the MHST being the professionals coming in if we can actually get more into the sites I think that would also expand and upskill the schools if you see what I mean yeah I hope that answers the question thank you Peter I can see a question from um, Ali there. Yeah, uh, thanks, Peter, for that. That was a really um, interesting presentation. And I guess this is just a, a point of information for members. We have just had notification from NHS England and the DfE that there is some additional funding coming downstream to um, widen the scope of our MHSTs that would obviously cover Bracknell Forest. So we're we're waiting to get the, the, the detail of what that looks like um, and what our allocation really looks like. So it's just a bit of good news to share with you, Peter, and, and I have been discussing with our BHFT colleagues, but we're waiting to hear what that further um, detail looks like. Fantastic. Okay, any more questions? Um, I've just got one question and I'm, I'm really sorry because I had to drop out of this call and go and pick my son up from school. And um, so I, you might have already covered this, but this is a whole school approach that you're talking about. Um, mm. One of the things that I, when I was reading all the public health reports, um, one of the things that is, is a concern is that children who are looked after, so um, children who've been in care, and they seem to have higher mental health concerns than... Um, uh, children who are not looked after and actually we're higher than the average the national average and I was just wondering if within that whole school approach if there is any sort of targeted sensitization of the parent of the of the staff of, or, or any sort of specific groups that you work with and I'm sorry if you've already covered it no, I think it's, um, it's it's really important. I mean, there, there are so many protected um, populations within Bracknell Forest and and nationally as well, where uh, we know people with neurodiversity are more likely, more vulnerable to anxiety disorders and depression, and looked after children um, and anybody from uh, that as um, families that have had adverse childhood experiences, and so parents that have had adverse childhood experiences or are more likely to have children with higher rates of mental health difficulties themselves as well. So that, that is a, absolutely is a priority. It's one of the things that's really highlighted to us in um, the college hall uh, pupil referral unit. There's a lot of, uh, there's a real systemic impact on mental health and things like that. And I guess using frameworks like the Maslow's hierarchy of need about kind of um, thinking about getting safety and security and containing young people I think we if we think about schools as almost like a surrogate family sometimes as an opportunity to, uh, for young people to kind of approach if they feel that their school environmentally has a is is welcoming and is and their emotional needs are important to the school and and that and, and their environment reflects that I think we have more opportunities to then intervene earlier. Unfortunately, if we've looked after children and, and just in my clinical experience is that sometimes they try to survive for so long and the family tries to survive for so long, they, they get to a point where actually it's a, it's pro they probably need quite rightly and appropriately is that they probably need m more and multiple sources of support um, when they come through our, through our door. Um, and that's why I think sort of um, we did the, fortunately the mental health support team we work quite closely with our getting help team here in BHFT and they are quite closely linked with the early help hub and the um, sort of the social care teams and things and I think that's that's fundamental um, in terms and we have learned how to kind of talk bring cases from the mental health support team schools to the early help hub to see what they can do in collaboration with us and vice versa. So we have a multidisciplinary team, including educational psychology, counseling services, um, EBSA's um, um, nursing teams and everything on Monday morning. So 
are targeted to work for any refer any young person that comes from a looked after child background we can kind of use that forum to start generating collaborative treatment plans that involve multiple agencies rather than just being under one agency if you see what I mean so I think um, if schools could make uh, if we can we're going to be prioritizing and thinking about making environmental changes and trying to make school very welcoming and open to emotional well-being difficulties for any student hopefully that will bring looked after children um will be be looking at their school to as their surrogate family in a funny kind of way um but also i think you know continuing to work closely with our early help hub um and th those guys being given the uh, you know the, the freedom to continue engaging with us as best as possible um will probably go quite a long way yeah, I suppose um, one of the things about this then is that it needs to be consistent because if it becomes mm. a if it becomes a support network for any child, they need to know it's there. You know, it can't be a short term project. Anyway, sorry, I can see Ali's got a hand up. Ali, uh, it was just to to add on to what Peter was saying. We are mobilising the children <laughs> more cam service now it, it's already um available in west berkshire and we we now are beginning to mobilize it in east berkshire so that will really support that very targeted intervention for that that, that group of um of young people and we'll obviously be working with the mental health school teams as well but it will be quite a specialist offer um so that's just a point of information thank you any further questions all right, Hima, back to you. Have you got anything else to present on in this section? Um, it's Catherine. And Catherine, perhaps I think given the time frames, um, Chad, Catherine has got a quick presentation on what they're doing in terms of emotional health needs of uh, adults. Was that something again from a perspective of health and well-being strategy delivery as an important project? But I'm just aware of the time. So perhaps Catherine, we could uh, give the highlights and say what the project is about. You're on still yeah, you'll, apologies, this is only the third time ever I've used Zoom, so um, I might be a bit clunky, but um, I will, I'm just trying to share screen. Okay. Um, so you can see that? Can you see that? Yes, thank you. Yes. Great. Okay. I can't see you. So just shout if you need any questions. So um, I'm going to do a very quick canter through. Um, Berkshire Healthcare Trust Commission, um, the South Central, uh, what's called the Commissioning Support Unit, to do a piece of work um, to map all of our talking therapy services and then the needs of our population. We did this as part of a project looking at um, low level mental health needs um, and, and to make sure that we were delivering talking therapies to the populations in the right place and the geographical locations that we um, I, that met the population need. Um, so I'm not going to um, take you through that. Um, it's a what's called a, a, a geographic information system. So it's an interactive map. And obviously, I can't show you an in, it, it, it interactively now, but I have got some um, screenshots of what the map looks like. We will be using this, as I say, to underpin um, our mental health work and also our health inequalities work. Um, it is Berkshire wide and we do have the ability to work down into uh, localities such as uh, either Barks East or actually Bracknell Forest. Um, this gives you an idea of the landing page of the tool. Um, I don't need to tell you about the definitions of low super output areas. You will know all of that already. I know what a primary care network is. I won't take you through the methodology. So this is probably what you're more interested in. So these are the sorts of maps that the service gives you. So this one gives you um, Berkshire divided by catchment area, which is the local authority areas, um, and then the numbers of mental health services. So where it says low level mental health, it includes BHFT's talking therapy services, but it also includes 
um, voluntary community sector delivered services and any local authority delivered services. So it's it's a quite a comprehensive map, um, which is really, I think, really, really quite helpful. Um, the second map here, purple dots, identify locations where BHFT talking therapy service offer face-to-face -face appointments. You can ask the map to show which services are face-to-face, -face, which services offer via Teams, remote monitoring. So you can cut it in the different types of, um, we call them contacts, um, appointment types as well. Um, there is, um, there, there is a, a, a national perception that some of the lower levels of referrals into talking therapies might correlate where there are a higher number of ours roles that also work in mental health services. So we've tested that hypothesis in this and there does seem to be a correlation locally. So it's really important that those ours, um, ours funded mental health practitioners and our talking therapies teams are really well integrated together. In a sense, it doesn't matter if it's a BHFT post or a, a ours post as long as we're all working together and we're linking in and delivering integrated services to the people who need those services um, we've got um, physical access by driving time public transport and walking time for all of our services um, this just gives you a summary of the digital access platforms that we use for talking therapy services um, and then we've got um, information by type of referral um, whether the referrals coming self-referral, whether they're primary care referrals. Um, we do weighted times from referrals to first assessments, um, which we, you know, is, is fantastic that only 0.3% um, of referrals have to wait longer than 90 days. It's a high percentage um, are seen sooner than the national average. So that's a really good um, piece of information to find out. Um, there was, we asked the CSU to look at our referral process to self-application process to see if there were any um, improvements we could make. And they did come back with a number of recommendations, which we, we've already um, started to put in place. We cut the, demo, the referral demographics by age and disability as part of our health inequalities lens, get an idea of uh, uh, the population um, being seen, whether it reflects the numbers that we would expect it to reflect. Um, and you can see there's a higher number of 25 to 34 year olds, um, you know, up to just under a third. Um, and then it tapers down as you go through the older age reigns, age reigns. And then and the little pie chart on the right bottom right, as you look at it, you can see um, the disability and no disability um, with a very healthy, not only 3 percent not status. So that's a, a, that's very good. It's not great when you see you know, something like 30% not status. So that's um, that's really helpful to see. Um, we cut it by employment status. Um, we cut it by ethnicity. So we understand um, which um, populations are accessing our services. And then you can layer any of these. So you can look at ethnicity by locality, by driving time, for example, by age, by employment status. All of these slides are interactive and you can ask the map to cut, to, to give you a picture of, for example, ethnicity by refer, self-referral by area. Um, we've got demographic uh, deprivation indices included as well. Um, and then we've got a whole host of recommendations at the end. So the purpose of this tool, which is amazingly powerful, is to help us um, inform the, the planning of our services going forward and um, to make sure that we have we are delivering our services in the places where it can maximise the benefit for patients. But it also is an important part of our health inequalities programme of work. The other project that is relying on this is our Mental Health Act Detentions Programme of Work, where we are now building into this map all of our mental health services, including crisis um, and community urgent services. So we will have the same sort of information for all of our mental health services rather than just talking therapies. So I really have galloped through that, but I hope that's, that's given you a bit of a picture of the tool that we've got in development within um, BHFT. And I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Andrew, you have a question? Yeah. 
Yes, so uh, Catherine, thanks for that. It was a canter, you're right. Um, is that, so that's a public website that we could get onto and access, or is it just for health professionals? Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a portal that BHFT um, have paid for, and we have a number of licences for. So it's not a public website. But what we, we, are, we are looking at doing is um, creating a, a sort of like a request for information form. So if you or somebody within Bracknell Forest wanted some information just about Bracknell Forest, you would be able to request that information from our team and we would provide that information back for you. Thank you. Any, oh, Grania, have you got a question? No? No, all oh, right, you've come up as on my screen. Um, all right, Nicola, question from you, thank you. Hi, Catherine, thank you for that. I just wondered, because um, I can see that we're still exploring the tool and experimenting with it and cutting it in different ways. When do you think you might have some thoughts of where you might need to change the services based on the information? When are we, When is it going to move from testing and understanding the tool to get, getting insights that then would lead to changes in this way the service is provided? So for the talking therapy services, that piece of work's already complete. Um, so we would be able to look at um, an analysis of where people are, where the services are located now. And we've already started that piece of work. For the other services, it's within a particular parameter around um, detentions um, and the hypothesis that maybe more black people are ending up in detention because the, the crisis service isn't available to them at the right time in the right place. So that's the reason why we're building it up for that way. But in a sense, that's the beauty of this tool. If you've got a specific question or a specific um, problem that you want to solve, you can build this tool to help you answer that question. But in terms of talking therapies, we already have that analysis. So what I didn't get clearly enough Catherine and it's probably because I couldn't cope with the pace of, of <laughs> sorry the that's right but <laughs> what have we changed in the talking therapy service if anything as a result of the additional insight we gain through going through this process we've already changed the self-referral application process going into the talking therapy so we learned that um it, it's a self-referral way in. So even if a person goes to a GP and the GP says, I really think you will benefit from talking therapies, the the um, logic is that the person self-refers because if they don't self-refer, then they haven't got the motivation to actually engage with the service. So that's the thinking. Um, so that the actual self-referral process still is self-referral. But the form itself was quite clunky. It was too long. It was too complex. So we've shortened the form, made it much more plain English. And it's now available in a number of different languages where it was only in English before. So there was some quite quick wins, I suppose, in a sense. So all of that's already been completed. Um, we do have uh, one of the, the benefit, you know, one of the positives is that the referrals into talking therapies do in the main reflect the mix of ethnicities across Berkshire so that is good um, but there are some pockets where we could drive some improvements and, and we're already focusing on those. Thanks Catherine really helpful. Good. Thank you. Um, any more questions? Uh, I just had a really quick question and it's that one annoying one of are you going to be able to share those slides? I will, but it, what I it you'll really have, interesting you did go it, it is. What I wanted to do, this is a version as of December, and what I wanted to do was share the latest version. So that's why I haven't okay. put get, shared these to go on a public website because I want to share the latest version. So yes is the answer. Okay. Fantastic. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Any you. Right. Hema, have you got anything else from your, your gang? No, I think we are done. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much. So we'll move on to um, agenda point nine, which is working together to deliver a resilient winter. And I think that's over to you, Nicola. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Chair. So I'm going to give a bit of an introduction and then I'm going to hand over to Ben and Sarah, who will introduce themselves to give a real Bracknell Forest flavour. Um, so I'm Nicola Airy. I'm the place convener for Bracknell Forest and work for the ICB. Um, and this is a really important conversation. Um, we, I hope that the slides were clear to you and I'm really keen for you to ask questions 
but also offer help and support from your particular organisations if you can't see your contribution already coming through our place-based plans. So why, why do we plan for winter? Why is it a thing? Um, uh, during the winter period, in terms of the pressures on health and care services, they increase because of the conditions that are particularly affected by the winter. So the demand for our services is, goes up. So we have to prepare for that, prepare for that surge in anticipation. Um, why, why is it important this year more than ever? Um, you'll probably all be aware that across all our services, whether it's health or social care or our voluntary sector partners, that we are dealing with more demand than ever and we have less flexibility with our capacity. So even slight increases in demand or slight reductions in the capacity ha we have make managing services even more difficult. So it's even more important this winter to plan for if we have a surge, how we would cope uh, with it. So that's a, just a very big reminder about sort of why is winter planning important. You'll see from the slide pack, there's, there's two kind of types of slides. The first few slides are around the context and the NHS planning guidance and really set the frame for the context. And then the second set around what we are doing in Bracknell Forest to prepare. And I've asked Sam, uh, I've asked Sarah and Ben to focus on our, our Bracknell Forest centric uh, uh, actions. So I, we're not going to go through the slides at the beginning. If you've got any questions about the um, approach, the timelines, the planning cycle, then do ask at the end. Um, what I would like to acknowledge on behalf of the NHS um, is we are terrible about producing slides that are user friendly to our partners. Our slides, our NHS slides are NHS centric. And so you'll see the NHS language, you'll see that the aims are NHS focused. Um, but I would encourage you to see behind that NHSness and recognize that um, winter planning is a partnership plan. You can't do it in isolation. And also even this NHS plan do, does talk about roles and responsibilities for the local authority and social care as well. So I'll start with an apologize, apology for the NHSness of it. I'm happy to answer questions about the planning policy at the end, but I'd really like to hand over to um, Sarah and Ben to introduce themselves um, start from the slides that are about Bracknell Forest and for all of you to think oh what questions do I have about this and actually how can my <coughs> organisation further enhance these plans so over to you Ben and Sarah. Great Thank, thanks Nicola just to check everyone can hear me and see the slides okay that I've got on the screen fantastic so yeah Nicola's set the scene really well there I hope people have had an opportunity to look at what we've what we've shared obviously do take time it, it sets the scene perfectly for what the Frimley system is trying to do and why we prepare for winter and what I'm going to do is just skip down through like Nicola said so we're coming to through all the system and assurance piece to the integrated winter plan so what does it mean for Bracknell what are we doing and this slide here just illustrates a number of considerations and challenges that we have to go through during the winter period so there shouldn't be anything um, that, that's new to people but just to give you a flavour you obviously have the unknowns as a consideration thinking about uh, any potential Covid uh, or flu outbreaks that may impact uh, the demand on services there's the consideration and the challenge for the workforce we only have a, a finite workforce so anything new we're trying to do or services we're trying to front load we need to be mindful of the fact that there is only that limited resource in order to do so our community resilience so all year round, let alone in the winter, there's always that increased pressure on community resilience, keeping people safe and well at home. There's conflicting and competing demands for different priorities. So where should we be aiming the, uh, the majority of our um, additional resource to try and prevent people from either being admitted to hospital or keeping them safe and well at home? Population health, which has already been touched upon um, in, in this board meeting as consideration, making sure we're, we're recognising the, the differences in our population and the services that we need to provide to meet those uh, demands. The communications piece is huge. It's a massive piece of our winter planning. So making sure we've got our comms right, that's across, across health and social care, 
many people will be aware of a lot of the material that we already use, the Nowhere to Go and from the Healthier Together, for example, that um, provides that service, uh, the signposting for parents uh, of children and young people. And finally, there's the building on, on good practice. So learning from what we've done in previous winters, myself and, and Sarah um, both lead on winter either side of health and social care. We've been doing so for a number of years now. So all the good work we've done previously, making sure we, we bring that forward to this winter. The, the approach for our winter um, planning in Bracknell is very straightforward. We, we always um, look at three main domains, the admission avoidance, community resilience and discharge and flow. So number one, keeping people out of urgent and emergency care services. Number two, community resilience, keeping people safe and well at home. And number three, the discharge and flow. So if people are in uh, the acute um, system, then how do we get them through quicker and then discharged at the end safely um, to their um, normal place of residence, their home. The winter plans that we have um, are extensive. All the schemes and pathways that are business as usual and the new schemes through, through new funding sources that we're able to provide to support patients um, and thinking about if we're standing something up, what are these services aiming to do? How will they support people who lead on it, et cetera? So behind all the planning, we have a natural integrated winter plan that details all that information. Just an example there of some of, of what the integrated plan will look like. So we'll have um, three different cohorts, which runs from children and young people, mental health through to adults, and then each one will then have a separate tab which links back to admission avoidance, community resilience um, and discharge and flow. So we can see everything that we've got going on in Bracknell, um, how it links, how it supports those different domains and what we're doing, what services are there to be able to support Bracknell patients. And what I'll do, I'll just hand over to Sarah, I'll just give you a flavour of um, the schemes uh, and some of the pathways that are led by local authority. Thanks, Ben. Hi, everyone. Sarah Van Heerde, um, Commissioning Manager for Integration. <clears throat> Apologies, I have a lagging COVID cough. Um, and as Ben just touched on, all the planning that we're about to talk about and the schemes that we put in place are all jointly agreed uh, and um, jointly discussed and planned. So it's really great to come with you know, plan I went in terms of togetherness. So um, one of the uh, government initiatives to support us through winter period is the Adult Social Care Discharge Fund. The current uh, fund for 23-24 is the second round of funding that we've had. Um, and that was, um, the last one was given to us specifically over the winter period. And this one we're able to use throughout the whole year. So Bracknell Forest uh, took the approach together to utilize maximum impact of this, this fund across the whole year, recognizing that, yeah, absolutely, we receive additional pressures during winter, but we're also experiencing quite a lot of consistent pressures throughout the year as well. And this enables us um, to have some additional resources to focus on areas that we might not be able to uh, resource uh, through our business as usual. For example, where we recognize some blockers come up in terms of discharge and flow across the system, we can put in some initiatives. And there's some examples below um, additional use of assistant technology to provide families and people at the point of hospital discharge to help them feel safe at home with their health being monitored temporary accommodation uh, to allow people to if it's not quite safe for them to go yet to go to a certain place that they'll be looked after before they can return home um, and quite a few additional resources in terms of um, posts and additional staff to support with the assessments and discharge to assess and enabling people to go home as soon as they can and avoiding any blockers in terms of hospital discharge. Uh, the Better Care Fund, which I've brought to the Health and Wellbeing Board a few times, um, does have quite a few schemes, spend schemes in it that supports hospital avoidance and emission avoidance work. And just some examples below at the bottom, we have a, a really strong integrated intermediate care service that works flexibly across the community and supporting people at hospital discharge. They're known to be responsive and they will focus and, and bring in their resource where required uh, to support system flow and to support support people reabling and being able to return to their home environment. Um, we, we provide support to unpaid carers through the development of our, our carer strategy. We're developing quite a robust work implementation work to support them. But one of the things that we provide through the Better Care Fund, which has been recognised, um, is we provide some additional payment to carers who are helping look after their family members following hospital discharge um, if in place of them um, working. So it just provides them that additional resource, recognising that they do play a key role in supporting people returning home and reabling. 
Forest Care again provides the additional assistive technology and um, we, we utilize step up beds so if people are quite ill in the community uh, in order to prevent them going to hospital they'll be able to go to one of our the step up beds in Heathlands and that will hopefully prevent um, the additional demand in our hospitals. Thanks Ben, if we can just pop over the next slide. Uh, the Market Sustainability Fund is um, ongoing support from local government to support us with the um, increasing costs that we're seeing for uh, care home placements. And uh, Bracknell Forest Council have uh, together an integrated approach. Bracknell Forest together have worked on redeveloping their target operating model, social care, and that's about supporting people and professionals to be able to access a one door through to our adult social care services uh, with an additional focus on um, hospital discharge system flow. Um, and one of, this, one of the key roles that has come out of this redevelopment of our model is to provide additional resource in terms of management focusing on hospital discharge. Uh, we also, um, there's quite a few work streams going across the whole Frimley RCS, across local authority leads and um, our health colleagues to look at some of the blockers and some of the challenges to system demand, uh, system flow, discharge and flow. And Bracknell Forest through the Better Care Fund have um, agreed to provide additional intensive support for you with quite high level of expertise to look at some of the key challenges that we have in our systems in terms of hospital discharge. And that's things like... Um, reviewing our transfers of care from hospital, complex placements, um, managing choice for families and complexity on discharge and ongoing development of integrated dashboards to monitor discharge and flow. That will be key information informing us where some of the blockers might be. And then just very lastly, touching on um, how we work closely with the voluntary sector. So uh, organisations across the voluntary sector led by Involve were able to um, bid for um, funding from the clinically involved clinically extremely vulnerable grant to support those with clinical needs um, through a preventative approach in the community. And that's an important layer to support that preventative element um, working with us. And also we have the Bracknell Forest Happiness Hub, which is an integrated collaborat collaboration of support services offering mental health and wellbeing advice for people over the 18, age of 18. And over to you, Ben. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Yeah, really good insight into all the work that's being done led by the local authority. But like we said at the start, it's very much an, an integrated um, plan in Bracknell. So just to give you a couple of examples of on the health side, bits and pieces that are being done, services uh, that are being increased and stood up over winter. So for mental health, I'll just pick for the one, the, the crisis alternatives. So we have the safe haven in these parks, currently operates four days, um, which gives people access to out of hours, same day mental health support. So the plan uh, before the winter period is to increase that. Uh, to seven days and for children and young people I mentioned before that Frimley Healthier Together really fantastic program that offers um, children and young people and parents of um, the, the signposting and advice in terms of if, if a child is ill and a paediatric consultant hotline as well is probably worth mentioning so that's uh, patients who uh, present in primary care the, the GP is enabled to um, have a uh, five day Monday to Friday nine till six access to a paediatric consultant on the telephone so just some examples there um, of all the different services and pathways that make up the integrated plan. And following on from mental health and children, we obviously have um, uh, primary care, uh, lots of different things being developed in the primary care winter plan uh, as we speak. Uh, at the top there, um, we always like to talk about, we have our urgent care pathway, integrated urgent care pathway, sorry. Some people may have heard about that as the minor illness pathway. So these are the same day urgent care appointments that um, patients from Bracknell are able to be booked into by their GP. If they contact with an urgent on the day need, the GP is able to book them into Bracknell Urgent Care Centre uh, Monday to Friday. We currently have 93 bookable appointments um, on any one day and that will continue uh, throughout the winter period. Primary care is very well linked into um, its community services, so all the integration with different services, such as what we've listed there, urgent community response, the frailty virtual wards and community pharmacist consultation service. So being able to um, direct patients into services in the community to be able to keep them, um, A, um, as part of a mission avoidance and also um, safe and well at home. Any additional um, ideas that are being discussed with uh, funds that we already have are, are on this slide. So thinking about training for the care navigators, 
um, in the primary care networks. Those are the people who are answering the phones to patients with same day urgent care needs, thinking about possible same day appointments, either through a GP practice or through the minor illness pathway, um, and also proactive case management. So focusing specific resource on certain areas, um, that, for example, patients with diabetes, hypertension, lipid lowering therapies, again, supporting that to mission avoidance, community resilience piece. Um, discussed about a lot of the work that's going on, the services pathways, but obviously how do we monitor it and how do we know uh, what's working um, and what the outcomes are. Well, we have a number of different forums where we're able to do that. We have our joint weekly meetings between health and social care, uh, badge to seasonal capacity planning, which take place on a weekly basis. Sarah's mentioned about the Adult Social Care Discharge Fund and those bids and also anything that's currently funded through the Better Care Fund. Um, those services are monitored on a regular basis. Uh, the first few slides in this slide deck that Nicola alluded to obviously outline the focus um, for urgent and emergency care as a system. So making sure we're aligned with those, um, those interventions, high, high impact interventions uh, and the um, requirements from the national team. These meetings Health and Wellbeing Board, also Place Committee and GP Council. Um, we've, we've brought here the, the plans for winter, but as we go through the next six months, we'll be uh, happy to bring back updates in terms of services that have, haven't worked, what are the challenges, et cetera. And we do our regular reporting to NHS England um, in terms of any money that we've been given, how that's being used, uh, what the impact is having uh, specific, specifically around the Adult Social Care Discharge Fund. And the final slide I've got is just um, to highlight the fact that our, our links with public health. This is some information that was um, from last winter, the Warm, Safe and Well and the Community Winter Hubs. Um, it's worth pointing out that this year for, for public health, and obviously work closely with HEMA and the team, that the winter is not a standalone campaign this year. It's more around what's been done during the summer throughout the whole year, what's worked well. And we'll obviously build that into our, our Bracknell Forest uh, winter plan. That's the final slide that myself and Sarah have got. So happy to take any questions. Hope that gives you a good overview of what's being done at place. Um, and, and obviously if people would like to take the time anyway to have a look at the slides in more detail, and uh, happy for people to contact us, but hopefully it gives you that flavor of uh, the integrated um, winter plan that's being developed in Bracknell Forest. Thank you. Thanks, Ben and Sarah, for all your work. And it always amazes me how much is going on in terms of current work now and preparedness for winter and just how well Bracknell Forest works together and is able to adjust and adapt very fleet of foot uh, when things change. So I don't know if there's any questions or anything that people think that they could offer into the plan that they would like to just highlight that Ben and Sarah can pick up after the meeting. Ronya, you've got a question there, and I can see. Yeah, yes, thank you, thank you, Chair um, Nicola. I, I just thought I'd give some observations because, um, as as with always, um, the the business of the winter um, obviously progressed throughout the year, especially with some of the um, increased activity in terms of planned care. So we are all very mindful of the capacity within the hospital and the health system um, is reduced. So the importance of um, supporting people to stay in the community, access the right service at the right time. Um, if they do go into hospital, for us to be able to support those individuals and out as quickly as possible, because of so limited capacity, it's even more vitally important this year. So in terms of our system, um, I, I just wanted to stress that, especially on the preventative side, because um, You've articulated, Ben, um, and Sarah, Nicola, the plan in, in a very measured way, but at the heart of winter, no doubt, it is going to feel um, frantic. So uh, I think just going back to the, the question that you asked about, you know, are we all doing everything we can? I think it's, it's important that we individually and collectively continue that dialogue at a local, in our local environments um, to see what else we can do together. Yeah, thanks, Gronion. Yes, we, we have reduced flexibility this year going into winter, so we're going to have to really work well together. And as well as um, uh, working clarity, I think just remembering to be kind to each other uh, when it when the pressure does come is really important. And certainly um, 
Gronya and I are very mindful of that and trying to lead that approach because it it will get tense at various times in the winter and we will be under extreme pressure. Thank you, Nicola. I can see a question from Philip there. Lovely. Thank you very much, Chair. And thank you very much for the presentation, Sue. So Philip Bell from Involved Community Services. Um, just really to follow on from what Ronnie was just talking about there, which is about that whole prevention agenda. And I think that that's something particularly uh, that the voluntary sector uh, can really um, assist. I think, you know, our particular strength is around social connection, um, keeping people maybe um, warm um, in different centres this, uh, this, this winter season and recognising those that are, are struggling and perhaps ensuring that they have access to all of the vital things um, to ensure that they stay well um, in the community, which I think is probably, um, which should be a central focus um, to us all um, this winter. So I just wanted to say that we have several alliances now across the, um, across the voluntary community social enterprise sector that were established. Our Hardship Alliance, our Older People's Consortium, to name but a few. And I think that there's lots of uh, experience within those groups that could be pulled upon to create um, or to continue to create the plan, um, which um, which obviously um, is coming along um, mightily well. But uh, I think there are probably aspects that we can bring to that as a sector too. Lovely. Thank you. Really, uh, thank you, Philip. We're so lucky to have your organisation and the others that you represent. So maybe Sarah and Ben, you could take away as an action to link in with Philip and just make sure that we're you know, full, fully utilising all the capacity and resources that we've got. Thanks, Philip. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, if we can move on to agenda, if there's no more questions, we'll move on to agenda item 10, which is um, uh, developing a health and wellbeing board forward plan. Um, now, um, Shall I hand this over to you? Who would this be? Would this be you, Andrew? Yeah. yeah. If, if I take this, I just um, thought it would be helpful for the board for us to start shaping future meetings and thinking about the work that might be coming down the tubes that we would want to bring to this meeting, rather than us um, just assemble a two week, two, two or three weeks before and think about what we might want to do. So having a more programmed approach to having items for the agenda. And it doesn't necessarily need to be anything offered now, but I think we'd like all of the board members to really think about what it is they would like to contribute to the board, what it is that they might bring to the board in terms of information or um, areas of work in which they'd like to have the help of the board to develop it, um, or anything that needs particular sign off by the board so that we start to plan our for meetings a year more um, more in advance and so that we have this as a standard item so today if anyone's got any ideas for the next meeting then please do shout but in the meantime after the meeting we will email out to you and ask for suggestions over the coming year as to what you think would be helpful to be here what you'll be working on and would like to bring here and as I say anything that needs determination at this board so I'll probably leave it at that, um, Councillor Wright, but happy to take any items for next uh, the next agenda or the one after that, if people have them. Okay, has anyone got any suggestions at the moment or um, will people want to drop? Okay, Grania, thank you. Um, th thank you. Um, Nicola, I haven't checked with you on this one, but um, I think in December we might be in a position to share the, the local health and care plan. Yep, I agree, Gronia. Yeah. Okay, we, we, we can put that on the forward plan, that'd be great. Okay, thank you. Anything else? No, I think that's fine. Thank you. All right. And then if we if we move on to agenda point 11, which is an agency update. I don't quite know what this means. So who, who's taking this one? Is that? Right. It's, just, it's just really if anyone on the call has got anything that they wanted to update um, the, the others on the call about. It's um, really a sort of a voluntary um, part. No one needs to lead it. Right, do we have any updates from anybody? Is 
All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Phil's got his hand up. Council right. All right. Oh, sorry. Go for it, Phil. My Go apologies. For it. I couldn't find my electronic yeah. hand. I was I was searching all over my screen. No. Uh, <laughs> very much. Uh, thank you, Chair. So, just really as a as a point of reference for colleagues, just to say that involved community services has recently uh, won a tender to uh, to be the lead organisation for the Frimley uh, VCSE Health Alliance, which we will be building. So, um, it's just uh, a, an information item for the Health and Wellbeing Board. Uh, it will strengthen the to voice um, on uh, on health related decision making and will give insights um, from our communities uh, into that decision making so it's a really exciting development for us uh, and we very much look forward to strengthening our relationships um, into the future with health colleagues thank you thank you Philip, you broke up a bit there, and also, um, what does VCSE? Oh, uh, sorry, Chair. Yes, so it's the so it will be the Voluntary mm. Community and Social Enterprise Health Alliance for the Frimley System. Oh. I'm hoping that you got that. Um, apologies. I think I think our chair might be having some connection yeah. issues. Yeah. Lovely. Thank you. <laughs> I think we all got that though. <laughs> Nicola, do you want to go? Yeah, I'm, I'm back on. Hi. I just wanted to. I shall I shall I take over chairing because I I think uh, we might be having some difficulty. Uh, would that be it, sensible? It's, it's okay, Nicola. I'll I'll, I'll take on chairing. Okay, I think, thanks. Um, uh, thank, thanks for that. Um, yeah, I think Councillor Wright, I think you are having some connection difficulties. So if you can hear this, um, Nicola, do you want to provide your update? No, it's really just to acknowledge the tremendous work that Phil and Involve do and the fact that they have been selected to take this role is is a recognition of, of the good work that we do and how lucky we are to have them in uh, Bracknell Forest. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicola. Uh, Councillor Wright, uh, I think your connection might be back now. Um, do you want, shall I hand the baton back over to you to close the meeting? Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, yes. Right. Any updates from anyone else? Fantastic. OK. Um, thank you very much, guys. So um, it's uh, 3.49 and I think that's the end of the meeting. And we're meeting again on the 7th of December. Is that right? Yeah, lovely. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks fantastic. very much, all. Thank Good to see you. Thanks.